Hello, everybody. Welcome to Healing Journeys today. My name is Teresa Hotelling, and this is How To Tuesday, where every Tuesday you are going to hear the word and learn how to use it. For those of you who are going to be watching this on replay, I want to encourage you, if you have questions, you are not out of the loop. If you have questions that you have during this video that you need answered, don't put them in the comment section below, but email them to me at info at fullyknownministries.com. Again, that's info at fullyknownministries.com. And every Wednesday on our Fully Known Ministries Facebook page at 11 a.m. Eastern time, I answer those questions. So don't feel like you are uh, lost. And just because you can't be here live doesn't mean that you can't get your questions answered. And you can find all of that information in the description below as well. What else? So this weekend, I had the opportunity to go to Andrew Womack's Gospel Truth Conference in Orlando. And wow, what an amazing time that was. Jeremy Pearsons and Andrew, they had an amazing message about spirit over flesh. That's what they talked about all weekend. It was it was like, hey, did they hear what I preached a couple of weeks ago on Healing Journeys today? It, but it was great. But the best thing about that conference was I got the honor of working at the Healing Journeys Today table. And I got to see some of you face to face and meet you and put and put faces with names. And man, guys, I miss seeing people. I miss ministering to people and looking people in the eye and laying hands on people. And so this was this was just an amazing time to be able to meet some of you face to face. And that was wonderful. And then Thursday night, Andrew called me up on stage to talk about my new book that he wrote the foreword for, The Unhealed Believer, What to Do When You've Done It All. Sold out by Friday. It was awesome. So if you want that book and uh, you want the revelation that comes along with that book, you can go to our website, fullyknownministries.com and find it there. Or if you're international, you can get it through amazon.com. Don't forget in the description below, anytime I reference a teaching or reference a verse, you're going to see the uh, there's going to be links for the teachings. I think there's four down there in, in this description, as well as all of the scriptures that I cover. Now, every now and then I'll throw a new scripture in there and it won't be in there, but then you can just go back and watch it later. So let me say a collective hello to everybody that's already on joining us live. It's so great to see you guys. Thank you for joining me on a Tuesday evening. And I wanna clear, I'm gonna start by doing this. I wanna clarify a statement that I made in last week's teaching. Because for, for the statement that I made was completely true, but it can be taken out of context. And I just wanna clarify it. So in last week's teaching, we were talking about how to know the love of God. And we were talking about Old Testament examples. And the statement I made was that the law was given to save us. Now, while that comment is fundamentally true, it can also be misunderstood and misinterpreted. So I just want to set the record straight tonight. I want to clarify it and I want to qualify that statement that it is a true statement, but the law was never going to save us. The law, we could never work to be good enough to be saved. The law, according to Romans chapter three says, I think it's verse 19, 19 to 20, says that the purpose of the law was to show us our sin and show us our need for a savior. That was the ultimate purpose and intent of the law. So you couldn't fulfill the law and be saved. But the law was given to show you that you needed a savior so that you could be saved. So I just wanted to clarify that. I didn't want that misunderstood. I'm not teaching that the law can save you. Lord Jesus, help us. The law cannot save us. Only the Lord Jesus can save us, right? 
So the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, how to make your spirit stronger than your flesh. And I have had some amazing feedback from that teaching. If you have not watched that, I would encourage you to go back. People are writing saying that it has changed their lives. It is impacting them in a, in a, in a way that they didn't think was possible. So I would encourage you to go back and watch that. And again, that link is down in the description. Then we talked about taking the hard out of Revelation. And I showed you in the word that not only is Revelation for you, but it is already in you. And we talked a little bit about how to start getting that revelation. And then I encouraged you to go watch a teaching I did back in October about how to receive revelation. And for those of you who haven't gone back and watched that, or for those of you who haven't read the book yet, because in the book I detail this, how to receive revelation, I'm going to go over real quickly the four principles of creating an environment to receive revelation before we go into what we're really going to talk about tonight, and that is how to recognize revelation. So how do you get revelation? And for those of you who have read the book and you've listened to the teaching, uh, I have a few nuggets or two that are new in this for you. So get your ears perked up. So the first thing, the first principle you can apply to your life to create an environment to receive revelation is to remove distractions. Remove distractions. Our world is full of distractions. Uh, it is television, it's movies, it's work, it's life, it's kids, it's dogs, it's soccer practice, it's Bible studies, it's our, our world is full of distractions. It's our to-do list for our house, right? And I'm going to read you a quote from one of my favorite books called Dangerous Wonder by Michael Iaconelli. And it perfectly describes what distractions are. He said, we did not want to stop hearing God's voice. Indeed, God kept on speaking, but our lives became louder. The increasing crescendo of our possessions, the ear piercing noise of busyness, and the soul smothering volume of our endless activity drowned out the still small voice of God. You know, 1 Kings 19 verses 11 and 12 say that God is not in the wind, he is not in the earthquake, and he is not in the fire, but he is in that still, small voice. And if we always have to have something in our ears, if we have to have music going or teachings playing or uh, TV going in the background to, to drown out the silence, then you know what? We're going to have a very, very hard time listening to receive that revelation. I think, do you remember the pair? Of course you do. The parable of the seed and the sower. It's in Matthew 13 and in verse 22, it talks about the, the seed that is sown among the thorns. And I just want to read that because I think that this is a description of distractions also. Matthew 13 verse 22 says, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he chokes the word and he becomes unfruitful. Distractions choke the word. You have a, a, a potential for a revelation on the inside of you. You had a word seed that was planted that you knew could heal you. And then all along comes all of these distractions and it pulls you this direction and this direction and this direction. And all the while it is choking that word, that rhema word, that written word that has been planted on the inside of you. This is why it's so important to get rid of distractions. You know, what are you willing to give up of the flesh to receive of the spirit. That was good, guys. And there's no condemnation in this whatsoever. 
I'm just saying you have to prioritize. If you want revelation, you're going to have to prioritize that above some things. You might have to give up some things that you really like or you really enjoy to, to give that necessary time in order to receive that revelation. Amen. You know, Martha, is it Luke 10? Uh, Martha in Luke 10, it says that she was seated. I think it says, and her sister Mary was also seated at the feet of Jesus. This means that there was one point where Martha was seated at the feet of Jesus and she was listening. But then the next verse says, and she became very distracted with much serving. Do you know that word serving is actually ministry? Do you know you can be distracted by ministry? You can be distracted by good things, by something that you're called to do. You know, I've been working on a getting a revelation about who God is in me. He's been trying to get me to focus on this thing for years. And I finally started doing it in October. And do you know that I can get distracted with much ministry? I can get distracted preparing for teachings on Tuesdays and the Q&As on Wednesdays. I can get distracted with uh, teaching India, teaching China, putting, putting teachings together, writing the devotions, working on the next book. I can get distracted with ministry. Those are good things. But I also have to be very, very purposeful when it comes to revelation, because guys, we need continuous revelation. We need continuous hearing so that we can keep moving forward and so that we don't get stuck and get stagnant where we are. So even ministry, even what you're called to do can eventually become a distraction and that ministry can replace relationship. And relationship is the heart of revelation. Revelation will flow from that relationship that you have with God. So that's the first thing, removing distractions. The second thing is to ask for revelation. Let's read James 1.5. Hebrews, James. He, uh, James 1 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given to him. This simply means that you can ask God for whatever you need. He's going to give you more of an answer than you even need, more answers than you need. And he's not going to make fun of you for asking. Now, from our last teaching, one of our last teachings on how to take the heart out of revelation, I shared with you that you already have all the revelation that you need in your born again spirit. So you might be asking, Teresa, why do I need to ask for revelation if I already have revelation? And that asking is more about you and your attitude and your posture than it is about God, because he already has given you all the revelation that you need. But when you say, God, I know that there's more that I need to know. I know what your word says, but I need more than head knowledge. I can admit that I don't know it all. I don't know it all. I need your wisdom. I need your understanding. I need you to take me beyond what my what my unrenewed mind knows right now. And you know what you're doing when you're saying that, that God, I don't know it all. I am admitting that I need to know more and that you are the only one that has the answers. You're you're really humbling yourself and you're and you're turning your spiritual ears on to say, you know what, mind, you don't know it all. So listen up. It's time to hear what God has to say. So I believe that that's the purpose behind James 1 verse 5, that it, it is all about an attitude of the heart in the asking. So that's number two. Number three is to pray in the spirit. So let's look at just a couple of verses. We also talked about these in the how to take the heart out of Revelation. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 says, For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. 
how be it in the spirit, when you're praying in the spirit, you speak mysteries. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. When you speak in tongues, you're speaking mysteries. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 tells you that those mysteries are the wisdom of God. So as you are praying in the spirit, you are praying out the wisdom of God. You are praying it from your spirit into the natural. And then if you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians 14, 13, it says that he who prays an unknown tongue should ask for an interpretation. So you can ask for an interpretation of what you just prayed in the spirit. Now, most of the time, I only do that when I am dealing specifically with revelation. And, and here's a very important point with praying in the spirit. You're not just thinking about anything while you're praying in the spirit. Okay. You are thinking about what it is you are seeking revelation on. So for example, as I have been seeking revelation on who he is in me, in the beginning, that's what I started thinking in my mind as I'm praying in the spirit. I'm thinking, God, I'm asking you to show me who you are in me. I need to know who you are in me. And this is what, what I'm thinking. And as I'm thinking, then he'll bring something to mind. And it brought me to the miracles of Jesus, which brought me back to the first miracle, which is the God creating the universe and how his words hold his power and how his word is in me. And as I'm going along, as he's showing me these different things, I must have meditated and prayed in the spirit about those, the things that he did and said in the, in Genesis chapter one for a few weeks before it morphed into the word is in me because the word is Jesus and Jesus is in me. And now this miracle creating word that, that formed the universe is in me right now. And that's what I am thinking on. That's what I'm meditating on as I'm praying in the spirit. If he's given me a verse, I'm, I'm thinking about this verse. I'm seeing this verse as I'm praying in the spirit, because your mind can be very active while your spirit is very active. And that's obvious because there are times when you're praying in the spirit, if you're not careful, you're going to end up thinking about your to-do list or the laundry or the what you're having for lunch or, man, I'm really hungry. Oh, I need to remember to pay that bill. So you have to be very purposeful. So when it comes to praying in the spirit, I'll actually set a time for myself every day, whether it's 15 minutes, it depends what's going on that day or 30 minutes, but I'll set my stopwatch and I will take that entire 15 or 30 minutes praying in the spirit, focused on that one thing that I am going after for revelation. So that's the third thing. So you've got remove distractions. You've got ask for revelation. You've got pray in the spirit. And then the fourth thing needs the least amount of explanation. And it is the most vital is to always keep the word in the forefront of your mind, whether that's the written word or whether it is uh, the spoken word, his rhema word that he has spoken to you. He told me once, Teresa, you know me as your savior. You know me as your healer, but you don't know me as your deliverer. So when I was going after revelation on him as my deliverer, I had that in my mind. Father, I know you as savior. I know you as healer. I need to know you as deliver, deliverer. Show me. And, and these th I always keep that there. I'd write it on a note card. If it was a verse that I'm studying, I put it on a note card and that note card goes with me everywhere. And it is a constant reminder that this is what I'm to be thinking on. This is what my spirit is trying to get to me right now. So those are the four things. Remove distractions, ask for revelation, pray in the spirit, and always keep the word in the forefront of your mind. And the way that you bring those all together and get them to work is through consistency. You have to be consistent 
with it. Don't get distracted. And you can't just do it for five minutes in the morning. You can't do these things for five minutes in the morning and then spend the rest of your day in the world, thinking about the world, watching the world, hearing the world, meditating on the world. It, it isn't going to do anything for you. So you have to spend time. You have to prioritize. You have to go after this. Guys, this is, this is where your life is is this life here on earth is just temporary. We're, we're working for an eternal reward here. So tonight we are going to talk about recognizing revelation because I shared with you last week the first revelation that I ever got and that was about the love of God. And I'm going to use that as an example tonight and I used to think that my first revelation was in August of 2013 or September of 2013 when my revelation was that I didn't have any revelation. But God showed me just last week that that is not true, that when he spoke to me in December of 2007, after I had been 15 years on the run from him, right? 15 years as a born again believer, spirit filled, running hard from him, at the bottom of my pit, when I didn't know how I was going to get out, when that voice said to me, even though you have run from me, I have never left you. And I got a revelation of his great love and goodness. That was my first revelation. But for how many years? 14 years? I didn't recognize that that's what it was. So I want you to be able to recognize when you receive revelation. So that's what we're going over tonight. And by the time we're done, when you get revelation, first of all, when you get revelation, you just know it. But these are just little hints for you, okay? If you're not sure, then, then this is gonna really help you tonight. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is feelings. Ugh, that word just makes me cringe, but... There are two feelings, and I'm going to use air quotes every time I say that word, that I have experienced when I have received revelation, not all the time. And let me first start out by saying I wasn't seeking a feeling. I wasn't seeking an experience. I was seeking God. And these are just two things that happen to occur a few of the times that I've gotten revelation. And I've also heard other people say that they have had similar experiences. So if you have these experiences, I just want you to be aware that they're a pretty good sign that you are about to get revelation or you have received revelation. So the first feeling, I'm going to call the roller coaster effect. I love roller coasters. The steeper, the steeper, the decline, the twistier, the turnier. I don't think those are words, the better. I just, I love roller coasters. So you know that point where you are, you are on your way up and it is like straight up. And I love to be in the back because when you're way in the back, you get the biggest effect from that roller coaster when it whips around corners and around the loops and oh man, nothing like it. So you're on your way up and you're watching and you start to see the top cars, you know, you're losing sight of the people in front of you and you know that they're going over the edge, right? And you get to the top. And it's that moment where you're still going up from the momentum and the roller coaster is going down. And there's that brief moment of like weightlessness where, you're, where your stomach is like in your throat and then you get whipped down. It's that moment right there, that right on the edge moment. You might, you might have heard people say it's just, it's just right there. That's what I'm talking about. That's the that's the feeling I'm talking about. It's it's an anticipation. It is it's it's just right there. I can also explain it like bungee jumping. I've only bungee jumped once and it was to get over my fear of heights and that did it for me. If I can bungee jump, I can do anything with heights. And it was the kind where they strap around your ankles so you have to dive out. 
So you dive out and you're free falling and I'm screaming my head off, right? But you get to the bottom and there's that point where your body's still going down and now the bungee is pulling you up and there's that brief moment of weightlessness. It's like a it's like a, a quivering on the inside. It's like your spirit man when it comes to revelation, it's like your spirit man is so excited because your brain is going to get it. It's just it's just like right there. That's how I would describe that pre-revelation feeling. So man, guys, if you are right there right now, I want to encourage you, you keep going because you you are going to get it. You're, you're suddenly, that suddenly revelation is, is right there. Now, the second feeling I'm going to describe to you, I'm actually going to show you a video. There is a metal called cesium that reacts violently with water. And I've only had this experience twice. One was on January 31st, 2014, when I got the revelation that I am a spirit man. And I actually experienced seeing from my spirit for a few seconds. There was that time and then March 13th, 2014, when all of the revelation I had been getting over the last six months came together and it was like, <laughs> that's how I would describe it. But I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to do my best to screen share a video with you right now that shows you cesium reacting with water. Now, I want you to I'm just going to show you first and then I'll and then I'll explain it. OK, here we go. Y'all pray for me. We're screen sharing. Here it comes. Hold on. Here it is. OK. Let me just make sure you can see it. Yes. OK, so this is a glass container with water in it. OK. And this is what happens when cesium comes in contact with water. This is it. <laughs> Guys, I love that. I absolutely love that. that's what it feels like. It's like the it's like the water is revelation and the cesium is your brain and and it's like those two things come together and it's just like it's just an explosion. I I just can't if if that doesn't explain it, I don't know what's going to explain it. So that's the feelings I have experienced with revelation. Yay, I'm so glad that worked. Everybody's clapping. So I'm, I'm thinking that y'all were able to see it. So what revelation is not, I think is also important. Revelation is not you go to church one Sunday or you go to a praise and worship night. I don't know why I did a quote for that, but I'm getting carried away with the quotes. You go and you have a moment. You have a moment where you just feel feel the love of God, or you have a moment where somebody uh, says something and a verse just drops in your spirit, a moment. But then by the time you get out to the parking lot, you're thinking about what you're going to go eat or what you're going to go do or, and, and it's completely forgotten. And you might have a, a glimpse of, man, what was that? What was that? Dirt? I know that there was something, right? So that thing that you that got dropped in your heart or that uh, verse that was spoken or that word from the stage that that hit you had potential for revelation. But because you didn't take it and you didn't cultivate it and you didn't meditate on it and create an environment around it to receive revelation, all it was was a fleeting thought. Does that make sense? So the best way, the absolutely best way to recognize revelation is through the word of God. It is the most reliable. It is the most accurate. 
if you think that you hear something from the Lord that has the potential to be revelation, you need to take that and you need to find it in the word. You need to confirm it in the word. So let's see your, let's say you're seeking a revelation on healing because that's why you're here, right? Or you're here for somebody. So as you're praying, maybe you're praying for a revelation on what's hindering you receiving your healing. If you hear something like son or daughter, there is something that I am trying to teach you and that's why you have not received yet. Or I am going to get glory in this sickness because you are going to suffer and die from this. Someone else is going to be saved. If you hear things like that, you need to take them and you need to find them in the word. And let me tell you right now, both of those statements, you go read through the gospels, you go read through what Jesus said and what Jesus did when it came to healing. And you will see that he never, ever, 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 ever said to anybody, you have to wait for your healing because you need to learn something. Or you know what? You just stay sick. And after you die, then the father is going to be glorified. No, death does not glorify the father. Healing glorifies the father. Am I right? Do you glorify God when somebody dies from cancer? Sure, maybe somebody at the funeral got saved. But don't you think God would have gotten a whole bunch more glory had that person been healed and received that healing through the word? I forgot where I'm going. Uh, yes, you need to find it in the word. Okay. Second Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God breathed and it is useful for teaching. God will only teach you, correct you, rebuke you, whatever needs to happen to you through his word. He never uses sickness or disease. So thoughts like that, I like to look at potential thoughts of, of revelation as being like suitcases on a conveyor belt. You know how you get, you fly in somewhere in the airport and you're standing there and all the black suitcases are coming by and they all look the same and you think this one is yours. So you pull it off the conveyor belt. And then what do you do? You don't just run off with it and claim it as your own, right? You look for that dent or you look for that scratch, or I like to attach colorful socks to mine to help me identify them. Now we just buy really funny looking suitcases and that makes it a lot easier. But the point is you're going to take that suitcase off the conveyor belt and you're going to examine it. You're going to check to make sure that it belongs to you. This is the same thing that we do with potential revelation or thoughts that come that, that you think could be revelation. You're going to take that revelation off the conveyor belt, or you're going to take that thought off the conveyor belt and you are going to examine it and you're going to examine it in the light of the word. And you're going to see if it's for you. And if it doesn't line up for the, with the word and it it's not for you, you're going to put that thought or that potential revelation right back on the conveyor belt and send it on down the line. It does not belong to you. Everything that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, everything that is revealed from your spirit to your mind is always going to line up with God's word. And that is the most sure way to tell if it is revelation or not. There are also, turn over to James 3, verse 17. You can also identify revelation by certain characteristics that it's going to produce in you. After you have revelation, you're going to see these characteristics in yourself. And you might not see all of them. Uh, they may not even, these aren't inclusive. There might be other things. And, and you may not see all of them at the same time, but you will see some of these. And I'm going to use my my healing in 2014 and that first revelation in 2007 to to give you an idea of what it looks like and, and to demonstrate that for you. So go to James 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above, do you remember just from earlier in the teaching, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, 
1 Corinthians 2, 7 say that the wisdom of God is spoken in mysteries, right? So the wisdom of God, you can call that the revelation of God. His wisdom is our revelation. His wisdom is our spiritual understanding. So you can call his wisdom revelation. So the revelation that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And we, we're probably just going to get through the first one tonight, and then we'll finish this teaching next week because I want to have some, some time to answer questions and uh, pray with you guys tonight. So the wisdom of God that is from above is first pure. I see this word pure in two lights here. Pure meaning that the revelation is going to be pure, that it will definitely, absolutely, positively, 100% line up with the truth of God's word. But the dictionary defines pure as freedom from anything that contaminates or pollutes, freedom from guilt or evil. Purity can mean innocence or physical chastity. So purity, revelation creates a purity in your mind. It creates a purity in your thinking. It creates a purity, that, that purity in your mind and your thinking then leads to a purity in your actions. And, and whenever I think of something being purified, I think of silver. Because silver in its most raw form has lots and lots of impurities in it that need to be cleaned out of it in order for it to hold any value whatsoever. So how do they do that? They do that with fire. And I don't know if, if any of you have read the story, it's the uh, refiner's fire. And it's the story of a woman who went to a silversmith to watch this refining process of silver. So the, the heat is used to heat the silver. The impurities then rise to the surface. And then those impurities can be cleared away to leave pure silver. And this is a short story. So I'm just going to I'm going to read it to you because it's really good. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were hottest as to burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse that says, he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. First, I'm going to pause there because I don't want any of you to think that God puts you in the fire to refine you. Two people can be put in the same fire and one will get burnt to ash and the other will come out purified. It is what you choose to do, it, whether it whether your circumstances are created by someone else, if your circumstances are, are consequences of something that you have done yourself. It is never God that brings you the trial, the tribulation. It is never God that brings the sickness or disease. He is not placing you in the fire, okay? But if you will turn to him in the midst of that trial, you will be purified and you will come out of it. Now, that's not what we're talking about today, but I didn't want anybody to get a misunderstanding that I'm, I'm saying that God puts you in the fire in order to refine you. So let's read on. So he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver, and that's Malachi 3.3. 3. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered that, yes, he not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time that it was in the fire. If the silver was left a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment, and then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? He smiled at her and answered. He said, oh, that's easy. When I see my image in it. I, just, I think that's a beautiful picture of 
what revelation does in you. I, I see revelation as the heat, actually, and I see your mind as the silver. So as that revelation comes and it heats up your mind, it brings the impurities to the surface. And let me give you, let me give you an example of that. Uh, so it brings wrong mindsets to the surface. It brings false doctrines that you've held onto to the surface. It, uh, it holds, it brings unbelief, hidden unbelief that you may have to the surface so that those things can be cleared away. Revelation does that. In 2007, when I got that revelation of God's love, first of all, y'all need to know that growing up, my parents, my family were wonderful, but because I had black heads and white heads when I was born, fourth grade, I started developing cystic acne. Kids are cruel. And I dealt with a lot of rejection my entire life through college. Uh, my, my first, my first husband, I cheated on my first husband. And then when I left him, the man that I cheated on him with rejected me. My second marriage, my husband rejected me when he cheated on me with a man. How many of y'all know I had some fear of rejection issues going on? A lot of bitterness, a lot of unforgiveness, a lot of hatred towards people. When I was sitting in my room that night in December of 2007, at the end of myself, and God spoke those words to me that though you have run from me, I have never left you. All of those, all of those fears, all of that fear of rejection, all of that need to please people so that they wouldn't reject me, all of those things came to the surface. And with those words, with the revelation of those words, it just wiped it all away. And I can honestly say to you that from that moment on, I have never had a fear in an instant. You don't need years of counseling. You don't need years of counseling to get over trauma from your past. You don't need years of counseling to get over unforgiveness and bitterness. You need a revelation of the love of God. And I would encourage you to go back and watch that teaching from last week that's called How to Know the Love of God. Because after that moment, when he heard my voice and when I took hold of those words, it became mine. I made it mine and it completely changed my life. 180 degrees. I am headed down a dark path. And the next moment I am running towards him as fast as I can. And I have not stopped since. But I, after that moment, th those fears, those rejection issues, all that, that heat of revelation heated up my mind, brought all of that stuff and just cleaned it out. That's what happens with revelation. That's what happens with my healing, with my healing. It brought a lot of stuff up, but on March 13th, 2014, a lot of that stuff had been coming up over the last six months and coming up and the revelations had been cleared it out. And if there was anything left on March 13th, 2014, when he said, you are healed from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, and I knew it was so, all the impurities just gone. So that is, that is the first way that you will know that you have received revelation is it will create a purity in your mind, which then leads to a purity in your actions. And that's where we're going to stop tonight because I don't want to rush through this. And guys, we've got every Tuesday for the next who knows how long. So I want to take some time and answer any questions that y'all might have. We'll do a little bit of time in prayer here because prayer is powerful. So Nancy has a question. 
Nancy says, I know this is about revelation, but what if you need to hear from God about a specific issue in your life? Do you take the same steps and think about that issue while you pray in the spirit? Absolutely. Nancy, that verse in James 1, 5, when it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, that can also mean if you're in, if you're in, I don't know what to do land, you can ask for wisdom. If you're facing a circumstance or a situation and you need his wisdom on how to deal with that thing, absolutely employ the same thing uh, to it. Uh, the four the four things imply those same things thinking about what you need that answer to you know i do that when i have if i have a tough i'm not going to say tough person but if i have a tough situation that i'm dealing with if i'm ministering to somebody and i'm just really at a loss you know i've i've told them what i what i know and nothing seems to be working I'll, I'll pray about that person in the spirit. I'll ask God to give me wisdom and revelation. And most of the time coming out of that prayer time, I'm going to know what the answer is. And if I don't, I have confidence that when I see them the next time, I'm going to know when I need to know. So it's having confidence. You know, it's that, it's that hope again. It's that positive expectation that first John, uh, First John, shoot, five verses 14 and 15 says, this is the confidence we have that if we ask anything according to his will, and you know, it's his will because it says in James 1, 5 to ask, if you ask anything according to his will, then you know that he hears you. And because you know that he hears you, you know that you will have what you ask. So when you pray, you have a positive expectation that you will have your answer. Question from Carl. I love this question. What do I do when I'm reading the word and a verse seems like it jumps out at me? I know exactly what you're saying because for so many years that would happen and I wouldn't know what to do with it. So I just go on to the next verse and it's like, I know he's trying to tell me something, but I'm not sure what to do with it from here. The first thing that I do with a, a scripture, if it pops out of me, out, out at me, out of me, out at me is I'll go to blueletterbible.org and I'll actually do a word study on it. It's very easy, Carl. You just go to blueletterbible.org. There's going to be a, a slot where you can put the scripture in. Next to the scripture, there's going to be a little button that says tools and the scripture. And you click on one of those and it's going to give you a list of the Greek words. And what I do is I'll read through the Greek words for each word in that scripture and then I'll make that verse my own using those definitions. Something's typically going to jump out at you when you're reading through these definitions and it's going to click. And then you take that and you write it out. You write that verse out. You write it as you have, you write it out as it is in the word. And then you write it out as you have translated it using the definitions from the, from the Strong's or from the Thayer's, whichever you use from the blueletterbible.org. It's really easy. Don't, don't make the, uh, don't take this as hard. It's really easy. Go in there, type in your verse, type on the tools, and it'll give you the, give you the definitions. So then you take that and that's what you apply those four principles to. And I guarantee you that it will lead you to one thing or to the next thing. And it may be just that one verse that you stay on for a while, but don't let go of it until you get it. And you'll know when you get it. It'll be like, wow, I, I see it now. I, I never saw that before. I see it now. So that's what you do with scriptures that jump out at you. Question from Shirley P. Can I lose the revelation that I receive? I wouldn't necessarily say you can lose it, but I have experienced this also, that it can become stagnant. If you have revelation on something and you... 
I actually, this happened when we went to Jordan. I got healed in 2014. In 2016, we sold everything, gave everything that we owned away and moved overseas to study Arabic for two years. And those were a very, very hard two years. And I started to develop some symptoms again because I was under so much stress, so much pressure, and I wasn't doing what I knew I should be doing. So despite the amazing revelation that I received, sickness, I won't say sickness, but the temptation to be sick in the form of symptoms came back in my body. And when I had to go back and and re-stir that revelation up. I had to water it again, right? It was kind of wilted and all, you know, like that. I had to water it. I had to, I had to cultivate that ground around that revelation again. And then I needed, I needed new revelation on top of that because what I was dealing with over there in, in Jordan was very different than the circumstances that I was facing in Colorado. I knew how to win and be healed in Colorado. Remember I said that God said to me, you know me as savior, you know me as healer, but you don't know me as deliverer. He gave me that the year, the first year we had spent one year in Jordan and we came back and I'm like, God, I, I need some help here. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm not understanding. I'm, I'm, I, th I thought that I, I was walking in this, in this, I know I was walking in this revelation. I know that I am healed, but I need you to show me what, what, what's going on. And that's exactly what he said to me because I did know him as savior. I did have revelation of him as, as healer, but I needed my deliverer in Jordan. So then I started pursuing that and that brought deliverance from all of those attacks of the enemy. So yes, you know you can't lose it but it can wither up. So it needs to be cultivated. Many people think that after they get their, their healing, that that's just, that that's just it. They can just lay everything down and sit on the couch and, and not do anything anymore. But you have to be continually in the word. You have to hear the word on a continual basis to, to, to maintain that's how you got there. Why would it be any, why would it be any different that, that that's how you maintain? So if you're at that point, surely, then just go back and, and cultivate that ground again and water it and just revisit it. You haven't lost it. You still have that revelation. Uh, Charlie, what part does thinking on, these are great questions, guys. Thank you. What part does thinking on and meditating on God's word play in receiving revelation? Man, meditate, Joshua 1, 8, meditate on these words day and night so that you may observe to do and then you will have success. Then you will prosper and have success. Meditate, it's Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing your mind is, is a chewing, like a cow chews its cud. You, you are meditating on it. You are keeping it running through your mind day and night. Whenever you have a split, a split second, you are, you are running those things through your mind. So they play a huge role part in revelation because you know god can speak to you like i was talking about earlier where he can speak to you and you can experience something or something can get dropped in your heart but if you don't take that and you don't it's just like a plant it's a seed it's a word seed right if you don't water that seed with prayer and meditation and and thinking on it then the seed isn't going to grow it's just going to lay there Okay. A uh, question from Leslie. Will you please repeat the four steps to receiving revelation again? The unhealed believer, what to do when you've done it all <laughs> is details. 
those four principles of receiving revelation. There's also a full teaching on it back in October on Healing Journeys today called How to Receive Revelation, but it is, ready? Remove distractions. Those of you that know it, you say it with me. Remove distractions. Ask for wisdom and revelation. Pray in the spirit with that revelation in mind and always keep the word in the forefront of your mind. Question again, uh, question from Lori. Should you write down the revelation you get? Oh, yes, ma'am. Do you know this book is full of revelations that I journaled over that six month period? That's where this book came from. Yes, write it down. Why? Because like uh, Shirley asked, if you can lose revelation, you need to go back and you need to revisit and you need to read. And I even do that now. I'll go back and read my journal for those six months. It takes me a few days to do that. And I'll be like, whoa, I forgot about that. Or whoa, you know, I I, I need to think about that again. I, I didn't remember that. So yes, journal, journal, journal. It is so important. Hallelujah. Let's see. There is one prayer request from Angel Eyes. A sudden bone pain. So everybody, if you would, we're going to um, pray for angel eyes here. I think I got to all your questions uh, and then we're going to close for the night. So I want you all to stand in agreement with me for, for angel eyes. Her prayer request is a sudden bone pain in my leg came upon me Sunday, taking me to the hospital. Agree with me that it never comes back in Jesus name because by his stripes, I am healed. Angel, we just agree with you right now. I thank you, Lord, that that thing is our, whatever that pain was, it is, it is just gone. It is no longer in your body. It will no longer be a source of pain unless you fear it. If you fear it, you are going to give that enemy an open door to bring it back again. So you stay focused in the word. You stay focused on what he says. And you need to put that, you need to put that experience out of your mind. You, whenever it comes up, you counter it. You pull up any seed of fear that a thought of it may try to plant. And you say, nope, not ever having that again. And you're not saying that out of fear. You're saying it because it is the truth. You are lining up your words with what God says. And you know what? Move on. Just You just forget. Just forget about it. Because the Lord is saying that you are healed and he has the final say. Look, we had one more question pop up. I just booked a medical treatment that has been recommended to help with a pain I've had. I felt the Lord was leading me to do this, but now I'm just feeling like a failure. Is that just condemnation? Yes. Yes. That is just condemnation. You know what? Going, going to the doctor does not negate your faith. And especially if you feel like the Lord is leading you to do it, then know that the Lord is saying, hey, this is going to help. Let's let's do this and help you along in your healing process. There is nothing. I took medication for 13 years. I, I did my labs faithfully. I did everything I was supposed to do for 13 years until that I knew that it was finished. And I saw it as temporary. The meds were temporary. The treatments were temporary because I knew that I was healed and there would be a time where I saw it in my body. So yes, that is just anything that is condemnation is not from God. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus to those who believe. You believe there is no condemnation. So absolutely, you do what you feel the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. You are not a failure. You are a strong uh, you are a strong woman of God. You have a mighty warrior spirit on the inside of you. 
and you just keep believing that you keep speaking that. And I speak healing over your body right now in Jesus name, that whatever you need in your body, the Holy Spirit knows and he is right now working to restore and repair and rebuild it in Jesus name. Okay, guys. Remember, if you have questions that I didn't get to, please email them to info at fullyknownministries.com and I will answer them on our Fully Known Ministries Facebook page. Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern time, we do a live Q&A, me and uh, my husband and I, my, yes, my husband and I, proper English, and we have such a good time on those Wednesdays. So email me your questions. If I haven't got to them, don't put them down in the comments because sometimes I, I'm just not going to see them there. So please email them to me. The email is also in the description under the video. So let me pray for you guys. And then we're going to close for the night. Father God, thank you so much for, for the people that have joined us tonight. I thank you, Lord, that they are healed. I thank you, Lord, that even now your word is healing them, that they are blessed, that they are highly favored, that they walk in divine health, Lord, that they learn, that they, that they grow in the knowledge of you, that your grace is multiplied to them through the knowledge of you, Lord God. And as they learn and as they grow, that they every day, walk a little bit more and more and a little bit more in the divine health that your son, Jesus Christ, purchased for them to have. We just thank you for this, Lord. I thank you for these people. Thank you, everybody. I love you guys, and I will see you next week.